We are live. Let me give it just a second always to finish finalizing these settings. Oh. Redirecting and we are good. Okay, wonderful. Uh, hello again, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Welcome back in. Um, I do have uh, at the start of this block and the next block, I just want to make a quick reminder tonight is our uh, virtual exhibit tour of the uh, the Places and Spaces exhibit in the Mapping Science Project. That is, as I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, the one part of the conference that won't be happening in Crowdcast. That's going to happen on Zoom so that we can do a, a nice relaxed uh, uh, exhibit tour and then hopefully a little a little social hour, some time for us to some time for us all to chat. Um, that Zoom link will be posted uh, in in about two hours. Uh, I'll put that I'll put that Zoom link online right before around a, or around an hour before uh, before that 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 room opens. So uh, look for that in the chat for Crowdcast as well as on the website. So without any further ado, uh, let me introduce our our next speakers. Uh, we have with us uh, Maximilian Neuchlin and Andrea Lorkis, who are going to talk about uh, computational analysis of interdisciplinary model template transfer. And I, I have to brag on them for a second. They submitted what is probably the prettiest abstract file that I have ever seen for anything in my entire life. So I'm really excited just to look at the talk which follows. So without further ado, please take it away. Thanks. Thank you very much. And uh, we are very happy to, to be at this conference and have a chance to to talk about our, our work. So what I'm going to do is in the next 30 minutes or Maximilian, I will present you some of our computational analysis of interdisciplinary modeling practices or model transfer as I said in the title. And I should mention that this is part of a larger project on scientific modeling practice, practices in philosophy of science on which I'm working together with Taya Knutila at the University of Vienna. So what we would like to do, argue with this, um, with this project or with our paper here is that, you know, these kind of computational methods can be very fruitfully applied to philosophy of science. So this is at least what I learned over the last months. So um, you should go. So here's the outline of the, the talk. So the talk will be mostly consist out of three parts. You know, I would start to say a little bit about our general interest in interdisciplinary modeling practices, and especially about the transfer of models between different scientific domains. Before then, in the second part, Maximilian will take over and um, talk about our computational analysis. And I should say that this will be the main focus in this, um, in this, um, in our paper because of, you know, the topic of the camp, uh, conference. And last we will, you know, we will finish with uh, presenting some of our results. So, let me start with some general observations and remarks concerning interdisciplinary modeling practice. So it is maybe it's a very general observation to make that some models such as, for example, the Ising model or the lotka volterra model can be found outside of the original disciplines, also in other scientific domains. But, you know, if you think about it a little bit, then there are some interesting questions popping up from this observation, especially, you know, when you ask, so how do these models actually get transferred into those different domains and how do they become applied in other domains than, for example, the Ising model in, in physics? So a second observation, which is more related to model transfer, is that in the case of mathematical models, such as, for example, the Ising model, these models are not just transferred by themselves, but that the models get, that these model transfer includes 
the transfer of concepts and mathematical and computational tools which are attached to them. So and as examples, you know, when you look at the case of, of the icing model, we find that, you know, concepts which get, you know, this is a case study, which I should mention, I did earlier on with, with Taya Knutela on the icing model. So the kind of concepts which get transferred when the icing model got transferred into, for example, neural networks where no concepts such as phase transitions, bifurcation and critical exponents, which by themselves in this new domain don't immediately have, have a meaning. So computation, when it comes to computational to mathematical tools, we find that you know, scientists are working in neural network with partition functions and master equations and you know, computational tools. They're making use of mean field approximations and you know, really complicated stuff, which we call these replica methods. So this all led us, you know, based on these, these kind of, of case studies, led Taya and me to introduce this notion of model templates, which is somehow, you know, we, we took it from Paul Humphrey's concept of um, or computational concepts and, 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 and theoretical uh, templates, but I don't have time to, and I don't want to, discuss this here, just our notion of, um, of model templates, what we try to, to capture with this notion, this the intertwinement of a mathematical structure, which is instantiated by the mathematical model with mathematical and computational tools, as well as concepts, which, you know, when, that, when you take this whole package together, may depict some kind of general mechanism that is potentially applicable to any subject or field displaying particular patterns of interactions. I know this is a lot to swallow and to digest, but this just, you know, is our result from thinking about this kind of transfer of models between scientific disciplines, what's going on. So as a next step we wanted to take, that we want to take now is, you know, to, to broaden our to broaden our view and this means that we decided together with Maximilian to make use or try to make use of large-scale computational analysis which aim to go beyond individual case studies and to explore the dispersion and application of model templates and a similar point has already made made yesterday by Henrik Kargel Sörensen, I hope I pronounce it the right way. So, and as Maximilian in the second part of the talk will show this kind of, you know, going broader in, includes that we try to contrast the thematic contents of papers of scientific articles with mathematical tools which are used to them in them. But he will talk more about, about this point. Now only one final thing I would like to mention here is that, you know, when we when we came to this point that we decided, okay, we want to have, we want to have this large scale computational uh, analysis, we had to decide on some kind of you know new model template. So what are what would you like to look on? And our you know our choice was then to go for synchronized oscillations and partly because they are so beautiful as you can see this on these little fireflies, this little bug here, and they are the forests in, in Malaysia where you have the, you know, thousands of these fireflies and they are blinking and in, in the first view it looks there, this blinking is somehow randomly, but over the time it becomes synchronized. And this is one of the favorite examples of these of the applied mathematician Stephen Strogatz. And he thinks that this is a kind of an universal, you know, universal phenomena, this kind of uh, this uh, synchronized oscillation, which you not only can find with fireflies, but you know, orbiting planets and lasers and all kinds of um, other systems. And he writes that at a deeper level all these different systems and 
are connected by the same mathematical theme, self-organization, the spontaneous emergence of order out of chaos. So in a little bit less Freudic way, would could also say that these that these are, or in our understanding, these are more, you know, along the lines of of model mathematical models, which are instantiating this kind of self organization leading to synchronized oscillation. So this means, first of all, to understand these mathematical models, and second of all, to see what kind of concepts are related to to them, and so on, and see how they get transferred. So and. The last point is here, the, one of the models, you know, there are many models for synchronized oscillations. One of the models we are focusing at the moment on is this Kuramoto model. And as you can see from the equation, these are, you know, because of the sign title, it uh, sign function, it's a nonlinear equation, which means nonlinear dynamics, which you nicely see here on the animation because it shows this limited cycle uh, limited cycles, and uh, the coupling is via the phases, which are in the argument of the sine function. And this animation is a little bit, you know, more complicated because we have this phase shift by this alpha, and you see that you not only can uh, study the synchronize, synchronizing behavior, but also people use it to study chaos because you see that here now that comes this noisy and random patterns are showing. So, and now it's time for Maximilian to go on. Okay, thank you, Andrea. Um, so, um, as at the outset, we were interested in looking at uh, patterns of uh, synchronization and oscillation. So, to construct our sample of articles which we wanted to investigate, we started by uh, searching these keywords in the bioarchive and the archive, so two, two preprint servers, and um, which are, as, as the decided authors show, quite nicely integrated into scientific practice. And we downloaded uh, the respective articles uh, to further work with them. And we process this data in uh, the way which is depicted in this flowchart here. So you can see we have uh, the articles from the bioarchive and the archive. And what we are interested in is um, contrasting the thematic content of the articles with the mathematical content to see how uh, mathematical structures, which we associate to a certain degree at least with model templates, um, tie together or divide certain uh, thematic, thematic structures. And so what we did is we extracted from each article the first four formulas and um, passed them into a processable format, which in our case means uh, converting pictures of formulas uh, from the bioarchive into LaTeX. And um, from the archive, of course, we can luckily use uh, the LaTeX directly. And um, then we convert this LaTeX into MathML, which is structured mathematics format, uh, which I will show why this is useful in a minute. Um, okay, so then we, uh, for, uh, on the one hand, we um, process the texts of the articles in a, in a way which tries to bring out the thematic structure. Um, and what we did there was, uh, I think a relatively uncontroversial usual uh, machine learning routine for, for text processing. So what we do is we split the articles into, into text vectors where we basically count the words that appears in each article and we build a big table out of that and then we apply TF-IDF scoring to it. Um, then we use singular value decomposition on it to around 300 dimensions and then we apply a UMAP on that, uh, the mapping algorithm uh, by McInnes and Healy. And um, then we cluster on the uh, internal KNN graph of the UMAP uh, using Louvain clustering in this case in the implementation by Holoku. Um, and what this gives us in the end is a, I think, a quite useful mapping of the 
which hopefully appears here in a second or two. Um, it does not. That's unhappy. Okay. That's not what I wanted to have happen. I will try whether I can open it externally. No, I cannot. I can do it here. Okay, great. So this, uh, I'm sorry for the technical hiccup. Uh, here's the mapping that you should have seen uh, right in the browser before. I don't know why it didn't work anyway. Um, so in this map, each um, point represents one of Hang the- Hang on, we're, uh, we're, we're, still not, we're still not seeing it yet. I think you need to switch back which window you're sharing. In, oh in, dear, in yes, of course. Yeah, I see. So sorry for that. No, no worries, no then worries. Then I will just switch shortly for a second into Firefox. Can you see it now? Yes, got it. Lovely. Um, okay, so again, sorry for the hiccup. Uh, here we are. Um, so this is the thematic map that is given to us by UMAP. And what this should basically represent is each little dot um, represents one of the articles in our sample. And each dot is close to the, um, the articles which are similar in terms of cosine similar similarity in that case to it. And this gives us like a broad overview of the themes which are present in our sample. So we can see, for example, here towards the right, we have three clusters which are basically drawn from astrophysics and which are nearly totally composed of papers from the archive. And you can see also, if you look at these little bar charts on the side, which shows us, shows us the temporal distribution uh, of these, of these uh, clusters, you can see that these clusters have been present from the very beginning in the 1990s, because the archive is of course uh, quite an old preprint server. Then up here, the same, same story here for general physics clusters, I would say. Um, here in this, this more of pinkish color, we have a cluster that uh, uh, after investigating, we have, we have ident identified with applied mathematics where people seem to um, explore topics of synchronization and oscillation like the Kuramoto model, which Andrea uh, mentioned earlier in a, um, a rather theoretic fashion. And then down here, we have a cluster more interested, you see in the keywords, algorithm synchronization, uh, more interested in informatics. And as we go down here, I would say we have this little bridge, which one might associate to a certain degree of bioinformatics. There's also still a lot of archive papers in there. And then down here towards the lower right, we see um, the clusters, which are uh, mostly drawn from the bio archive and where we see keywords such as neuron brain neuron stimulation stimulus cortical or gene protein species genome so these are actual life science clusters and i think this is this is quite nicely uh, shows us the thematic distribution of our sample so now i will uh, have to switch back to a presentation give me a second i hope we let's see whether the next one works Okay, um, so one moment, please. Here we are. There you go. Okay, you can see this again. Yeah. Great. So now how to get at the mathematical structure of our sample. We have all these formulas, we have passed them in like a unified format. And what we then do is um, we apply tangent CFT to them. That's a technique that was developed by a Mansourian colleagues um, where they tried, and I think they're still working on this, where they are trying to build a search engine for mathematics, mm, which, should be useful basically also as an interface, for example, to the archive, but I don't know if they're in talks. Um, so how does that work in detail? Um, what we do is we pass each of the formulas into its passing tree. 
so into its, its order of operations. And then we extract from this parsing tree each tuple of two um, um, linked entities. So for example, here we have this, this formula x plus y squared equals zero, and we can pass it, uh, and we can split it, of course, at the equal sign, and then we can split it as a plus, and then to the y is, of course, this, this square applied, and so on. And we get all these tuples out of there, and we encode them in a form of encoding, which on the one hand keeps both entities in there and their relations. So which one is basically above the other in the passing tree. And that gives us a, a representation of the formulas, which not only takes care of um, what's in the formula, like um, in terms of symbols, but also how are these symbols related and which symbols apply to which other symbols. So that's, I think, a, a rather clever um, way of representing formulas, which, which Mansuri and colleagues came up with. And what we then can do is, um, well, now we have just uh, lists of little uh, tuple strings, and we can just pass them to pass them to a language model. So we can pass them uh, to fast text, and uh, we can try to figure out through um, the uh, closeness re closeness relations. So how which tuple um, appears in the context of which other tuples, which tuple is commonly near with other tuples, and fast text has denied extra that also uh, takes care of um, like subword components. So also the internal structure of the tuple is is, is used for this for this analysis, um, and we can uh, arrive at a vector representation um, of each of each uh, tuple. And what we then can do is, of course, we can average these tuple vectors into vectors which, re which represent whole formulas, um, with the hope that these final formula vectors should uh, incorporate similarity relations between formulas. And then, of course, we can reduce these vectors with UMAP again into a two-dimensional mapping, and um, we have a map of formulas. So let's see if it works this time. Great, it works at least reasonably well. Here's the mapping we get. So each data point here is a formula. We have applied, in this case, uh, HDB scan clustering to it. So it's a bit, a little bit different clustering algorithm, which has a notion of noise, which is quite nice, because as you can see, um, this, this UMAP is much noisier, much less clean than the one we had earlier. And now we can, we can just, uh, investigate this mapping. So what we can do, for example, is we want to look for the Kuramoto model, which as Andrea uh, has mentioned, has the sinus term in there. So we can look for formulas that contain a sinus. And then uh, I'm cheating here a little bit because of course I already know where to look. We can zoom in on this region up here and we can have a look. What are the formulas that are here in this, in this corner of the map? And now we will have to wait a little second. Oh, there it is already. I hope you can see this pop up. Um, so here you can see that there are in this region a lot of similar formulas, which indeed we have seen a little bit earlier, or which are versions of the formulas that we have seen uh, just a moment ago in the presentation. So these are all formulas that can be used to introduce Kuramoto models. And if you look at the titles of the papers from which these formulas are drawn, we can also see that indeed the Kuramoto model appears quite often even in the title of these papers. So now the next step would be, well, let's zoom in a little bit closer on this, on this map up here where the, the Kuramoto model lives. And now let's project the colors of the thematic clusters, which we had identified earlier on these formulas. So each of these formulas now gets colored in the color of the cluster of the paper from which it was drawn. And what we see now is, uh, in a sense, a picture of how coherent the, the, the application of the Kuramoto model is thematic wise in the sample that we've looked at. And what we can see, I think, is uh, we can say a two point, a two point uh, analysis of this. Namely, on the one hand, there's clearly one cluster that is, that is heavily dominating. And this is the, this more of pinkish cluster, which we earlier had had um, identified with applied mathematics. Um, so that is something where a lot of the, uh, the, the, a lot of the usages of this Kuramoto formula um, come from. 
But on the other hand, we can see also that there is a range of colors present in this region here. So we can see these, these little yellow, yellow and this bluish um, cluster. So there are also like a, a broad array of uh, system specific applications of the Kuramoto model, which we now then of course can go into detail and explore. And the whole thing gives us um, like a general idea of the coherence um, of this, 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 this uh, model template. So uh, to sum up our, um, I would say um, inter, uh, like um, uh, current results. So this is, this is very much work in progress. We are still in the, in the course of analyzing these maps and there are some other, th uh, quite a few other things we want to do with them, but just to get a view here. So in this talk we have presented a method for opera operationalizing model templates. And of course, uh, if we go back to the, the more philosophical outlook on all of this, uh, the degree to which um, this, these, these attempts, it's oper operationalization and, apl uh, and application to, to uh, large samples of, of um, articles are successful, provides arguments that the model templates are indeed a good mode of, of analyzing um, at least this type of knowledge transfer between sciences, sciences. And as a more specific conclusion or, or example from our talk, now we can also say, okay, the Kuramoto model functions as a model template, which is both applied subject dependent as well as in subject independent context. So there are both people working out uh, um, or if you will, playing in a, in a serious sense with the Kuramoto model in a very, in a very um, abstract way, way, as well as working, uh, people applying the Kuramoto model to very specific um, contexts. Okay, so that uh, is the end of the uh, talk. I want to uh, also throw out for the discussion now, some, some ideas we have for further work. And also I want to uh, invite the ideas of, of our listeners, of our viewers, um, because I, I suppose they, they have opinions on how, on how uh, what you can get out of these methods. So the first thing we are still thinking about and struggling with is the, is the contrast of qualitative analysis uh, with these mapping al algorithms where you basically, you run, the, you run the map and then you work through it um, and quantitative analysis. How do you deal with the results of UMAP or TSNE or some other algorithm which, which gives you a, a nicely interpretable uh, um, uh, visualization? How do you move from that to um, a quantitative analysis and a quantitative result? Um, so what we've been thinking about, especially is the question of how to compare different embeddings. For example, one thought I, I, I was having was cluster on it and then compare the clustering solutions. Um, and the other question is, of course, uh, maybe somebody has an idea for a smarter way of getting from these tuples, from the tuple vectors to formulas and then to papers than just taking averages. Because that is usually and, and quite commonly done also with word vectors, but I'm not sure if that's the best way to do that. Maybe somebody has an idea and wants to tell me about it. Um, so thank you for your uh, attention. And I think we can move to the discussion and the questions. Fantastic. This is, this is really impressive stuff. I'm, 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 I'm really floored that, that uh, the, uh, the moment when you zoom in and find the cluster of similar formulas, that's a, that's a, that's a heck of a, of a shot. That's just amazing. Uh, really great stuff. Um, waiting on some, waiting on more ideas to come in. I'm sure they will in the chat. Mostly the chat is filled with people whose minds are blown by how cool this was. But uh, I do have one question already from uh, from Eugenio Petrovich who asks. Uh, so, do all the papers? It's kind of a disciplinary uh, uh, a disciplinary norms question. Do all the papers that use the model uh, tend to explicitly cite the mathematical formulas that are associated to it, or should we be? Should, are you thinking about trying to find informal citations to them of the model, sort of uh, ways to capture less uh, uh, less structured uses of these of these model templates? So, sure, should I take this? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So. Um, Actually, in, in, the, in the case of the Kuramoto model, uh, I think it is really, really common that people 
in just the first first equation or second equation in the paper, uh, slap the formula into there. Um, so so that's and actually that's the, just a funny side note. Uh, we have actually found people who obviously copy paste the formulas between different papers. So uh, you see just like the same formula very close to each other and you check the authors and you think, ah, okay. <laughs> so somebody didn't take like uh, the, 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 didn't make the work to like change the variables or something like that. Uh, <laughs> but um, so, so I think especially for the analysis of model templates, uh, we can be quite optimistic that often very similar formulas will be used because people introduce it that way. But in the long run, of course, we want to have an analysis which takes care not of one specific formula, but of like a, 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 a larger grouping of formulas, um, which have like a lot of co-mentions, co if you will, and which should bring us to like more of a, a, family, a family's resemblance uh, notion of uh, coherently used formulas. So then hopefully it shouldn't matter that much whether one specific formula shows up if the grand scheme of things remains similar. But we will see about that. Thank you. Great, thanks. I, I'll jump in with a question of my own. I wanted to ask, kind of picking up actually on something in, in, in Henrik's talk last night. So I wonder, in your, in your larger visualization, um, have you had a chance to, to click around and, and, if you will, be surprised? Have you found places where uh, similarity metrics have lumped together traditions of modeling or uh, uh, drawn connections between domains that you really didn't expect? So in, other, in cases other than the Kuramoto model, is that, have, you, have you seen some things like that yet? Yeah, it's, it's, you know, we are, we are really at the beginning of it. And I started, you know, to go through this map. And sometimes, yes, I'm, I'm surprised what I see. But especially at the moment, we look at the Kuramoto model. But then I find it, you know, in modeling earthquakes and all these kind of things. So and, and I wasn't expecting this. So that there was these kind of, of connections. So I think it's, it's really, really helpful to, to see you know, how these, these models are really get used by scientists. And, you know, also the question of, you know, why is this particular scientist, you know, recognizing some kind of similarities between synchronized oscillators and, you know, how earthquakes are forming. So it's not obvious to me. So, and these kind of questions you, you can really start to, to really dig on and, and uh, go deeper and, you know, get, get also a richer notion of this, um, of this model template concept as we try to develop on, on the long run with this method. Sure, that's great, thank you. Um, another question from, uh, from Jon Munsin who asks, so it's absolute, it's absolutely interesting work, thanks for the paper. Um, I was wondering if you can deal with uh, different notational variants of the same PDE when we use the same mathematical idea, but the notation formalisms are, are rather different. So that could happen, for example, when we have a matrix formulation versus a scalar formulation of the, of the same dynamics. Is that, a, is that a problem that you're worried about? So oh, uh, <laughs> to a certain degree, I mean, um, how should I say, I would say my, my, my answer to that would come from two, two sides. On the one hand, of course, we, we try to, or basically Mansouri and colleagues in their system, try to take care of that to a certain extent um, by using this, this relational uh, way of looking at formulas. So if something between the notation stays the same, there should still be um, at least some, some, some sort of overlap. So one thing we, we found quite interesting when we played around with the algorithm in the, in the early stages and when we were testing, for example, was that it quite nicely captures that the plus sign and the sum sign, like the, the sigma mean the same thing or like very similar things. So that's something that, that, the, that the algorithm actually um, can get at. On the other hand, I am not entirely decided on what my view is on whether I want it to. I mean, I obviously want to know to what extent it does that. But on the other hand, uh, both the different notation um, 
as well as the internal similarity are interesting facts for, for our like descriptive analysis of what scientists are doing. So um, yeah, I will, I, will stay, I will stay vague in my answer here. To a certain degree, yes, but uh, if it does not, then that's also interesting for us. Sure, yeah, 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 that's nice. That's nice, I like that. Um, let me see, let me let the uh let me let the chat catch up just for a second here um so i wanted to i wanted to ask a little bit and I, this is going to necessarily be kind of a vague oh wait let me sorry let me, let me not take two because someone else did someone else popped a question and i don't want to i don't want to don't want to monopolize the time a question from Catherine herfeld who says uh, such a great project um could you reflect more generally about how exactly you see your descriptive analysis of those particular templates uh helping answer conceptual questions about template transfers in philosophy of science more broadly so what kinds of questions uh what kinds of questions do you have in mind do you want or should i okay so yeah this is um at the moment at the, you know, at the present stage it's a descriptive um, analysis of um where we can locate this different kind of model and you know when we talk about model templates we talk also about these these concepts which coming within computational mathematical tools so at least at the moment we are able to to locate them and um, you know to to get more um, you know to do to points which are interesting for the philosophy of science you know we I think we discussed it before Catherine we we have to we have really to to more to do more analysis so they're really looking to where are they appearing? How do they get there? And um, you really have to follow those papers. You know, this is not an analysis which you know just opens up and and then you see you know how these models are you know and why these models are transferred. This means really further research, and this is a, the part we we just started to do because it's uh, we have to orientate ourselves in these huge amount of, of data we have now and um, it will take a while but you know the first results we are seeing it's very promising that it will help us to become more concrete about our you know the the model template concept Ty and I suggest which may be a useful concept for understanding this transfer. Great, thank you. Um, another question. Uh, another question coming in. Uh, oh, yeah. The, uh, Catherine says uh, it, uh, as a comment on the question. She says she says a fully agreed. I'm just very curious because this is just great. Uh, so let me uh, let me pick up a next a next question now from uh, from Christoph Malater with uh, with an amendment from uh, Eugenio Petrovich as well. So let me combine these here. Um, Christoph says, uh, wonderful to see how, how you tackle formulas. Uh, from a textual point of view, did you investigate how the word Kuramoto is spread throughout your corpus? So is the, is the in particular, whether the word itself is, is strongly correlated with the existence of the formula? So that's an interesting question about kind of cross-referencing our different analysis, our different analysis methods, or perhaps a specific, uh, Eugenio adds, perhaps a specific cited reference is associated with invocation of, of the formula. What did, what did you guys see along those lines? So um, on the one hand, yeah, um, clearly clearly um, the word Kuramoto figures more commonly in some clusters than in the others. It appears in the cluster keyword for one specific cluster, but not, not in the others. So um, there is some, some cluster difference here. Um, I think like what, what we are, trying to do in this analysis and also in so just maybe maybe as a background um the first thing that we tried when we tried to give these formula representations was actually to ignore the formulas and just use the context like the the two sentences before and after the formula to to give like a like a, a representation and contrast that with the broad thematic uh, structure of the whole whole paper and that worked so so i would say <laughs> so um like just just using the the, the word uh, works to a certain degree, but it's it's not I think not as satisfactory as as contrasting the formulas. More specific to the question, like uh, does the does the word Kuramoto um, correlate with the usage of this specific formula? 
I haven't tried that yet. So um, I haven't, I haven't like, I, I suppose you would, you would, you would ask whether how, uh, how largely overlapped between mentioning the word Kuramoto and um, this specific cluster of formulas, like in the formula clustering is, I haven't, I haven't tried that out. Also, and this ties into like the, the second point, which you maybe still can see on the slides here. It's not entirely, entirely clear to me. And I think, uh, I, I don't think it's like super clear to anyone how you actually compare these structures in a rigorous way. Because of course you can do a clustering and you can do another clustering and then you can just like count co-occurrences. But of course the clustering is more of a, like it's, it's one about, among many clusterings, of course. You could, you could look at different granularities, you could look uh, at different strategies of clustering and you would get very different results here. And so I think, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm wrong about this, but I think there's not a, like a super, super rigorous way of uh, uh, correlating or like uh, associating the substructures of these embeddings with each other. And uh, like I, I hope, I hope uh, that uh, in the very, very near future we will see work on that, and uh, then I hope to incorporate that. But it's not obvious to me how you would actually do that in a way that is that is uh, rigorous and not too, like, uh, um, endangered by the vagaries of of clustering algorithms and different layouts. Yeah, that's a really that's a really nice point. That in some sense, it's a a theme that's been running through all the talks so far today in some sense that we have these different ways of breaking apart these, uh, breaking apart these networks and it's not ever fully clear how to, how to manipulate more than one of them at the same time. Yeah, that's a really nice, that's a really nice point. I wanted to, okay, I can, I can still get in my, get in my second question without being, without being problematic, so I will. Um, this is a vague question, but I think it's, but I think it's important uh, because I think it, it speaks to one of the real strengths of some of the work that you guys have been doing. So I was wondering your thoughts on the interplay between you know, the formal uh, analysis work that you've been doing and the visualization work that you've been doing. So I can tell that that's a really important part of the way that you approach, the way that you think about these projects is, is really tightly tied. Uh, you guys have clearly put a lot of effort into visualizing this information. And I wonder, I wonder what your thoughts are about, about how you view that relationship and what that's like when you, when you're doing your work. What do you, what, 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 I'm, I, this is really like, I'm like inviting you to kind of ramble because I, I know this is not a very <laughs> clear question, but, but yeah, but, but your visualizations are gorgeous. And I want, I want to, to be let in on, on, on the process a little bit for you. Okay. Uh, so, if, if, I, if, I, if I may ramble on that. <laughs> um, so my thought on this is, um, I think we have, we've heard it yesterday and Andrea mentioned it also again today that, that um, case studies in philosophy of science are uh, not entirely unproblematic if they're like very focused on, on limited areas, especially if you think not about like science 200 years ago or 100 years ago, but science as it is currently developing in, in incredibly unoverseeable, uh, horrible pace. And uh, if a ph if philosophy of science wants to do, uh, wants to say something to that, I think to a certain degree, um, I mean, I think there's a lot to be gained from these, from, from more rigid quantitative analyses. But on the other hand, and that's where the visualization comes from, I think a lot of, uh, of important important insight is indirectly to be drawn from having like the right intuitions about like how coherent, incoherent, uh, different modes of science actually are. How tied together how certain 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 areas of science how how broad how how disjunct are they. And I think these are intuitions about that, which you can only, only arrive at through the contact with, with large data sets, because everything else will be, will be too disjoint and too, you know, everything you can directly capture by reading papers will be just way too small to actually have a good chance of being indicative of the whole thing that is going on. 
And I think that is really where these visualization methods shine, because of course you could do a quantitative analysis where you never see a map and never interactive, interact with anything. And you could in the end get like a score or a p-value or whatever out of that. And that could like be useful for doing hypotheses tests. But on the one hand, uh, it would miss, I think, a lot of the, the value for philosophy of science. And um, on the other hand, this is something that, that Mel, of course, mentioned yesterday. Uh, it's really important when you're working with machine learning algorithms that you have like a clear view always of what's, what's going on. And that's something that a lot of these visualization methods, I mean, they can trick you in, in important respects and, and you, should, you must be aware of that. But, um, <laughs> But they can help, I think, often to like uh, figure out um, problematic or uh, degenerative cases, for example. So if you have uh, in your data set, I don't know, uh, so where something in your scraping went wrong and, and uh, like uh, 20, 20 papers are just the same word repeated a hundred times or something like that, you sometimes, you sometimes meet that if you're using JSTOR data or something like that, you will see it at once if you do a visualization. There will be a weird cluster and you won't know what's going on there and then you can check it. And I think this, this interplay of like, on the one hand, providing correct intuitions about like these, these big data sets and on the other hand, um, figuring out uh, problematic going on in your analysis, that's where these, these mapping algorithms really shine and help. Yeah, Fantastic. No, that's, 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 a, that's a great answer. <laughs> thanks. That's really, that's really helpful. I really appreciate it. With that, we are out of time. So let me thank you again. Extremely cool stuff. Uh, in five minutes, we will be back with our next talk. So thank you all very much. And we will be back soon.